All right, guys, up next, uh, we're going to discuss vaccine protocol and Dr. Tom Hairgrove, Associate Professor and Extension Specialist, specialist at Texas A&M in the Animal Science and um, Vet Med Department. So, Dr. Hairgrove, are you there? Can you hear me all right? There you are. Yes, sir. I can hear you. Great, great, great. And so you're going to advance the slides for me? or? No, um, if you can share your screen and I'll super, let you do super. your slides. Okay. Great, great. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Real quick while y'all are getting that set up, don't forget that if you're logged in for CEUs that you need to be sure and stay logged in to the program. And we are not going to take any breaks, so if, but if you need to hop up and take a break real quick, that's fine. Just make sure that you leave yourself logged in so you can get credit for your CEUs. Can you see my screen now? I can see the um, presenter's view. So if you can have it show the, um, the actual slideshow. Oh boy, okay. I think it's just a setting on selecting a different screen. Yeah, if you have more than one screen, you may have to tell it to on on display settings, perhaps. Okay. Uh, look up top left. Next one over to the right. Try that display settings. Um, click it. Swap presenter view and slideshow. That works. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Good deal. Okay, so what we're going to talk about today is just vaccine protocols. And so we're trying to talk about, you know, basically the reason that you'd want to develop a vaccine program. I feel very strong uh, that if we get into canned vaccine programs, in other words, I'm, if I tell you something, what, what's a vaccination program built on? And it's, it's kind of like insurance and it's built on your risk mainly, right? And, and, and what your expectations are. So basically, would we all buy the same insurance policy? Would we all want to be insured for the same thing? The answer is probably no. So your vaccination protocol. First of all, why do you own cattle in the first place? And, and then how are you, are you selling calves at weaning? In other words, are you just stripping calves off, taking them to the sale barn, not castrated, not dehorned, maybe not even vaccinated? Are you going to maintain ownership through the stocker feeder phase or, or are you selling replacements? Are you selling replacement females or, or possibly males? What's your biosecurity program? And I think too many times our biosecurity program, in our mind anyway, is our vaccination protocol. Vaccines are certainly, certainly not 100% effective. So, so again, you need to be thinking about how what other ways am I going to control disease? Vaccinations by themselves are not the answer. And what are your risks? You know, how are your fences? In other words, with some of the sexually transmitted diseases, like Jason was talking about bulls a while ago, okay, they can go through fences asking cows, right? So, so things like Campylobacter, trick, uh, those are real important. Uh, how about your neighbors? Does your neighbor, what kind of disease control does he have? Is, is he somebody that's, a, you know, is he a cow trader? Is he bringing stuff in and out every week? Uh, you know, again, those are things to consider in your biosecurity program. How about wildlife? You know, wildlife can certainly contribute to some of these diseases. So those are things you have to figure in. And the types of pasture, especially when we go to talking about things like, uh, liver flukes and stuff like that, then, you know, the type of pastures and how you might utilize those pastures in different times of the year. And then what are your expectations from your vaccination program? And a lot of times our expectation is if we vaccinate, everything's going to be fine. And it just doesn't work that way most of the time. So most, most important thing, my opinion, is work with your veterinarian. Why? Well, your veterinarian is in your community. Your veterinarian understands better what's happening in your county and even your, maybe your part of the county. The, the issues you might have, the person two miles down the road might not have. So again, working with that veterinarian. I'm sorry? Okay. We were having some background. I muted them. Oh, okay. Good deal. So, and you'll need a veterinary... Uh, 
you need a valid veterinary client patient relationship. Why is that? It's for drugs, other things, but again, get that veterinarian involved. Document your vaccinations, your parasite control, all the treatments you're doing, document them, but the most important thing is evaluate them. How's things going this year? How's things going next year? I've got two pictures here of a veterinarian. And the one in the bottom is, is that veterinarian's actually doing something, right? She's got her arm up a cow, practically testing the cow or whatever. Okay, but look at the top one. It looks like she's probably just standing there shooting the bull with a couple of guys. Probably you're getting as, as much value from that top picture as the bottom picture. And we think as producers and a lot of times as veterinarians that we're there to do the technical things and, you know, pull the calves and do the cesareans and stuff like that. But who better to give you impact into your vaccination protocol? So again, I can't stress that enough working with your veterinarian and work with your local extension agent. Again, they have a lot better idea of what's happening in your area, in your county, and maybe in the next county. So again, it kind of gets back to the old IRM concept. In other words, working with your extension, working with your veterinarian, kind of come up with a plan together. That's going to be the most effective many times. So why do we have problems with vaccines, right? So I think the biggest problem is number one, failure to read and adhere to the label, right? So we get a vaccine and we read it and it says to do this and do that, right? Well, all right, but I've used this before. I've been doing this for 40 years or whatever. So we just plow on, things change. Things change from year to year. And some of the biggest problems I find is people not reading the label or not understanding, or somebody in the coffee shop says, well, that says a booster, but you really don't need that, whatever. Stay on that label, you know, stay on that label unless you have a real good reason, like I say, talk to your veterinarian, and that you might need to vary from that label a little bit, but, but that's where I see most of the problems with a lot of these diseases. They're not given the correct booster, they're maybe not vaccinating at the right time. We're going to talk about all those things. So the wrong type of vaccine given at the wrong time, is, that's a problem. The other thing is we'll look at vaccines. Unmute and over there. They muted back. It's only, you know, so it's only been expired a few days, right? Or it's only been expired a few months. Or, you know, this is 20, so it expired in 18. Will it be all right to use? The answer is no. If it's expired don't use that product. The other thing that we see is, is products it's getting good. too hot or too cold. It's been a thing. And so one of the problems we have is storing vaccines. Once we get them, and, and most the co-op, most places, they're going to give you a cold pack when you buy your vaccines, right? Or they, they certainly will offer you one. Get it home, get it home cool. We take it and we put it in the refrigerator in the barn. Where did that refrigerator came from? I mean, I practiced a long time and I know when I got another refrigerator at the clinic, it was when my wife wanted a new one at the house, right? So usually she was having some little issue with it maybe, but so a lot of times the refrigerators don't keep a constant temperature. There, there's all kinds of issues. So, and, and there's little thermometers you can put in to actually monitor that. It's very important. If you've got a lot of vaccines stored in a the refrigerator, then you need a, you need a, this refrigerator. And then again, off-label, like I say, not boostering properly, or actually one of the problems we see a lot now is overgiving products. Some people think, well, you know, I, I've had X disease, or I thought I had X disease, and so if I, it says I need to vaccinate, you know, once a year, but I'll vaccinate every two months or three months, stay on that label unless you have a real good reason to get off. The other thing is too little product. And so, you know, about 20 years ago, we started going more to the two milliliter products, right? Because they were giving less tissue reaction, et cetera. But we tried to use the old delivery systems that we delivered five mils for years with. So again, if you lose a half a CC because of air or whatever, and a five mil, you haven't lost a lot of dose. If you lose a half a cc or a half a mil in a two mil dose, you've lost 25% of your product. So again, select the 
correct syringe. Usually I like to use the smaller syringes for things with the two mil, the 25 mil, if you're using the pistol grip syringes. The wrong route or the wrong site. And again, that's very common. You know, we'll, we'll have a, a product that's supposed to be given subcutaneously. We're putting the muscle, cause a lot of, a lot of other issues in the muscle plus residue issues, right? And then how about the most products, let's say black leg, we go to the feed store and we've got uh, 20 cows to vaccinate today, but we have some more in a few weeks. What does that bottle say? Don't, you know, once you stick a needle in that bottle, don't reuse it, right? And you can certainly store it overnight or a day or two or something like that, but don't, don't leave that bottle in the refrigerator for, for a month or whatever, and then come back because Every time you stick a needle in there, you introduce stuff into it that, that might, other bacteria, things like that, that might damage that vaccine. Okay, and again, one of the other things you will see is, is cows that are not immunocompetent, they're stressed, they're thin, they're poor. Those cows are not gonna respond as good to a vaccine as cows that are in a good body condition score. Mineral deficiencies, and, and we say mineral deficiencies and it's more of an imbalance, right? Because we tend to think about these minerals and we think about a few of them, the ones that are more popular, and we want to focus in on those. Again, minerals have to work off of each other. So if you've got a deficiency of one, many times you're having problems with other mineral interactions. So again, your extension agent, your veterinarian, Nutritionists can really help you with stuff like this, is how to get a good mineral, uh, you know, that's gonna, that's gonna help my immune system, okay? And then the other thing is poor immune response due to heavy, heavy pathogen load. And I think first is calf scours. Okay, so we see a lot of problems with calf scours a lot of times on the same pastures. So if I'm calving heifers in the same little trap that my great granddad calf heifers in, there's probably going to be a fairly high pathogen load. So then if I'm using a scour vaccine with my cows, I might not get a very good response. So, so again, we'll talk a little bit about how important it is pathogen load and immunity in a minute. But, but those are the primary reasons we see for vaccine failure. This is just kind of like, where do we want to put the vaccines now? So, or where do we want to put product, period? We want to put anything intramuscular sub Q in the neck, right? And, and kind of by this little orange triangle. So let's stay in that area. But again, we don't want to put them too close together. If we're given four or five vaccinations, there's two sides of that neck, right? So we, we can go to the other side. And uh, and then the PO up on the top is where we put our forearms at. And then you can also down in, in the dewlap, you could give a sub to it if really needed or you know, behind in the elbow pocket behind the shoulder. But let's stay out of the, the rest of the, the animal. Let's not be giving these things in the hindquarters and stuff like that because of BQA, but sometimes because of FC. If we're sticking some of these products that are labeled sub Q, we're sticking them in the muscle, they're gonna cause a lot of reactions. So not only are we damaging tissue, we might not get a real good immune response, okay? And so this is just kind of showing a method for giving a subcutaneous injection. The tent's gonna be more likely that you're gonna be getting it under the skin, not nicking into the muscle. Now be careful with the product you're using there too. So, so be very careful that you don't stick this needle into your hand or and then the other thing with tin, if we're not being careful, sometimes we'll, we'll push through the bottom. But, but again, this is one of the suggestions to get a good, good subcutaneous vaccination. So again, this is the challenge and the immunity thing I was talking about a while ago. So as long as I have pretty good immunity, and my challenge is not too high, and that's the way this little, that little chart starts off, or little figure, then I don't have disease problems. But then all of a sudden, and that would go back like pasture, contaminated pasture I talked about a while ago. So if I have a lot of more pathogen, even though I have pretty good immunity, I'm still gonna get disease. By the same token, if the red line stayed straight and the green line went down, 
my challenge is pretty much the same, but if my immunity drops, I'm going to be more likely to get disease. So it's, it's just, you know, it's the same thing just thinking about yourself with human diseases. You know, you need good immunity, but you also need not to challenge, be challenged by any more of these pathogens and possible. Well, that's important thinking about your vaccination program. When diseases occur by age, so when do we see calf scabbers? Do we usually see calf, calf scabbers in lean cats? Well, you can maybe with some coccidia or whatever, but usually that's going to be pretty much after birth, right? In the first few weeks after birth. When do we see respiratory disease? We see respiratory disease usually around weaning, right? The stress of weaning has a lot to do with development of respiratory disease. And then as we get out with our cow herd, we're vaccinating mostly for reproductive diseases as we go on. The reason this is important is there's a lot of these diseases, a lot of these yeah, disease conditions or diseases, viruses that can affect things different, right? So BVD, we're gonna talk about that vaccinating point a little bit, but it could certainly cause an immunosuppression. So you might have more cat scours. Okay, it could certainly cause immunosuppression. So you might have respiratory problems, but it's also gonna, its biggest effect in the beef cattle industry is probably on reproduction. And unfortunately, we don't see much there except we don't have as many calves or when they start calving, we have some wheat calves and thrifty calves. So again, it's the same disease, but the vaccination protocol is gonna be a little different for what I'm trying to protect. Okay, so let's just kind of talk about the disease diseases as we go through and we're going to try to cover it that way. So first of all, sudden death. And so that's going to be like black leg, your clostridial diseases. So the, the number one there is black leg. That's the one we usually think about. And then you see the picture up at the right. You, you know, that's basically calves that are dying out on a field. So, but the other one that's going to affect a lot of us now, all these could affect us but the one that's going to really is, is next to the last one, and that's red water. So if you have any issues with flukes, if you're in a country that when you have flukes, then it's imperative that you get that vaccine in them. Because if you have flukes in your country, you're going to have some fluke damage. You know, the wormers are not going to control it 100%. So that's what I'm showing there is some livers that are damaged by flukes. What happens is if you get damage to that liver, and then this organism is released, then you get a sudden death, and that's called red water disease. So again, that vaccination protocol needs to be based on your risk. So if, I, if I'm out in West Texas and I don't have hemolyticum, it's not gonna be an issue, then I might not use that product, right? But I might use tetanus if I, if I have some reasons there. So if I've, you know, if I've got having calves in, in a horse lot, stuff like that, where a lot of tetanus is accumulated in the ground, then I might want to use a tetanus when I, when I castrate my calves. Is that everywhere? No. So, so again, watch your risk. So again, this is just trying to show, you know, a low lying area. So this probably would have a little bit more risk for flukes and, and maybe lepto and some other things that we'll talk about as we go on. But again, if you've got risk of flukes, hemolyticum is very important. So, so just to go to the, and, and be very careful of going down to the co-op or whatever. I, I need an eight way, or I need a seven way, or I need a, a nine way, whatever. You need to find out for sure exactly what you're getting because to some people, an eight way would be a clostridial with tetanus. To other people, an eight way would be a clostridial with hemolyticum. So, so again, be, be careful and, and uh, understand the exact products you need. And again, you're gonna get better with that talking with your veterinarian, okay? So that pretty much covers the, the sudden death diseases. Are they contagious from animal to animal? The answer is no. So why are they a risk? They're a risk because they're in the soil, especially poor drain soil or you'll see it a lot of times when it's real droughty, a lot of dust, 
these spores will be in the dust and so they're got, the cattle are going to take more of these spores in. Now the other problem is the cattle, normal cattle have some of these vegetative spores in them, right? Because they're going to get it from the ground, they're going to get it from, from breathing dust. But something triggers sometimes, triggers these things to cause them to have disease. So again, there's not much we can do to control this disease other than vaccination. But what, again, read the label. I've seen a lot of outbreaks with black plague through the years and people would argue, well, I vaccinate. Well, if you vaccinate a bunch of wet navel calves, you don't follow through on that vaccination. It calls for a booster then a lot of times you're going to get, you'll wind up with disease when this black leg usually affect animals. Usually about the time you wean them, right? And usually it's, usually it's my best doing cats. So, so again, that needs to be incorporated in everybody's vaccination program. To my knowledge, there's only one that does not recommend a booster. Read your label though, to make sure. Okay, let's talk about respiratory and reproductive diseases. And the reason I put these together is like I say, there's a lot of times histophilus is very tough. It's a, it's a bacteria, right? So it's often associated with pneumonia in cattle. But if you look over in the very bottom in reproduction, it's also been associated with abortions, okay? So the same with bovine viral diarrhea. It's associated with pneumonia in calves, but it's also associated with abortions. Okay, then you go back and, and the same with infectious bovine rhinotracheitis, that's herpes virus. Again, we'll see that's very much tied to respiratory disease, but also associated with reproductive loss. Like I say, usually with these reproductive diseases, usually with these reproductive diseases, you don't see a lot of things happening in the animal initially, in the cow herd, they're pregnant, whatever. And then when they start calving, either they've lost some calves, some abortions, or they'll have weak calves, etc. So let's talk about vaccinating calves. So at three months of age, traditionally branding or whatever we want to call that period of time, but about when they're approximately 90 days of age, it's very important if we can get vaccinations into those calves because we would like to, that, to booster those calves right prior to weaning if possible, okay? So again, a clostridial, a seven way or an eight way, okay? So again, be careful about your seven ways, your eight ways, understand, but that eight way, is it for tetanus or is it for red water? So again, if you live in food country, you need that red water. If you're Again, if you've got higher risk for tetanus, and that is, that is on some places, not all, then I would certainly add tetanus. Then revaccinate at weaning. I would recommend actually vaccinating prior to weaning if that's all possible. Because again, right in the stress of weaning, you're not going to get as good a response to your vaccination. Again, if these are male calves, then I would vaccinate them with the lepto, probably wouldn't, his focus is hard on hardrobovus, but because that's gonna affect more reproduction with your heifers and the deeper heifers you have. But I would give a good five-way lepto to these calves because occasionally we'll see issues with these calves breaking with, with lepto. And, and we'll talk a little bit about why, you know, where you're gonna be more at risk with that, feral hogs, et cetera cover that in a little bit. And, uh, but again, your heifers, your keeper heifers, make sure you revaccinate those at weaning and make sure that you give them a product that's going to be effective with, against hardrobovus. Okay, make sure, and again, that's a good conversation to have with your veterinary. How often do I need to give that? We'll talk a little bit about that in the cow herd later, but I want to get that into my cat. And then I'd, it would be good to get a modified live or kill IBR PI3, which is for influenza, DVD, and open uh, initial virus. Okay, so again, we get, we're going to talk a little bit about this in a minute, but we get all the arguments. Should I use a kill or should I use a modified live? 
you use a modified lead, make sure you understand you read the directions. If you use a killed, make sure you boost it. Make sure you read the directions. Okay, revaccinate your heifers again. I would either revaccinate them prior to weaning or after I had them weaned and kind of felt pretty good. I'm going to get my best immune response. So I don't like to vaccinate those animals right during the process of weaning. Replacements or stockers, again, steers at or before weaning. And again, before weaning, I would certainly recommend going back in, boostering that black leg, that's a clostridial. I would also booster my respiratories. And again, what am I gonna do if I'm going on to the, to the feeders? If I'm gonna retain ownership in these. And once I, if it's post weaning, if I'm going to background those calves a little bit, and that's when I might use my modified line. If they're still on their mama, if they haven't been weaned yet, then again, is your cow herd on a modified line? And if not, you sure the, you know, the directions on the bottle say not to give the calves nursing cows unless they're unless there's protected by a modified line. In other words follow those directions because all modified lives are not the same. Some are approved for use in cows and some are not. Heifers, so RB51, which is a brucellosis vaccine. Brucellosis is, is pretty much cleaned up, but do we still have a risk of brucellosis in Texas? Uh, yes, we do, especially in South Texas, closer to the border, but there's always a risk. And so I would recommend still continuing to vaccinate for brucellosis. Now, again, that's a conversation you need to have with your veterinarian, but that can only be given between four and 12 months, right? So that's, I mean, that's a regulation. So you can't come out here and decide when they're 15, 16 months old. Well, you can with permission, but, but again, we wanna keep that vaccine in about four to 12 months. Lepto, again, Let's revac, especially those heifers that are going into our breeding herd. And then we want to consider make, giving a vibrio to these heifers and then also a, a trick guard potentially. So we'll talk about that in, in a little bit. So here's your cow herd. Okay, so again, on the annual deal, and a lot of times these cows are just going to be up once a year. So again, you have to design your program around what you're, how you're, how you're dealing with your cattle, and what your risks are, and, and then your labor, your facilities, all these things go into it. I recommend giving a clostridial to your cows every year. Some people don't, and that's fine. But there are diseases that cows can die from. Can cows die from black leg? Not as likely, but it's certainly possible and it does happen if they lose their immunity. The important thing is if you're vaccinating this cow, she's going at preg check and she's going to have a lot of antibodies to pass on to her calf. So her calf's going to have some protection early in life. So again, that's my recommendation. Let's visit with your veterinary there. Okay, I want to give a DVD. IBR or herpes virus, and then uh, Tanisha virus, PI3. I'd like to give those also to my cows every year. But again, do I use a kill? Do I use a modified live? Again, it depends. It depends on the situation. So if I put a modified live in pregnant cows that are not, haven't been on a modified live, and directions on those, those particular products that are approved, it has to had that modified live within 12 months to get in, again, has to be on a continuous program. So if I give them a modified live when they were heifers and they're four-year-olds, can I give them a modified live again? And the answer is no, not, not if they're pregnant, right? So follow those directions. We've seen a lot of problems where people didn't care or they thought that, uh, you know, modified lives are all the same, right? And they're not. Some of them are, have went through a little bit more strenuous research and stuff to put on the market for protection against reproductive loss. So we talked a while ago, said, well, things like 
DVD, IBR. They were also important for respiratory, but the bar's different. The vaccine that I want to use to protect her for reproductive loss has to meet a little higher bar. In other words, that vaccine, I can't let the virus get through the fetus. That's, that's the aim of that vaccination protocol. With the respiratory disease, I'm just trying to limit the virus that's getting into the animal. Different approach. So again, be thinking about that as you're putting your vaccination protocols, depending on what I'm vaccinating, be it calves, be it cows, be it bulls, then I might be using different products Staying on the lake. Lepto, again, the five-way lepto, there's five serum bars of lepto that we have issues with. And again, you could certainly put them in at Preg Check. There's a lot of places that where there's a lot of risk, usually a lot of rainfall associated with your most of your leptos that are carried by feral swine, stuff like that. Now, Argyobobus is not is sexually transmitted. Right? So it can be transmitted in, uh, the same way the other, but, but again, it's, it's almost like its own little disease and it can cause a lot, can cause significant reproduction problems in your heifer sometimes, especially in your heifer. If it's introduced into a herd that hasn't seen it, it could be any place, anytime. But again, talk to, talk to your veterinarian because that's going to be a little bit more expensive, maybe putting a product in there. So I, I wouldn't put it in my steers, but I would certainly put it in my heifers. Okay. And then Campylobacter, what we know is good real. So again, I like to get that in pre-breeding if possible, but if I'm putting that in at preg check, I need to make sure that the product I'm using has a duration of immunity. In other words, is it gonna be effective? If I put it in at preg check, is it gonna be effective when that animal has that calf and then it's rebreeding. And so usually our old base products are a little bit more effective. They have a little longer duration of immunity. So that's gonna have a lot of effect and a lot of impact on when I give that product. If it's possible to give it pre-breeding, that would be the time to give it. If I'm just gonna give it at preg check, then again, I might be wanting to use an old base product there where I would have immunity when I need it. Scour vaccines, certainly we can give those to our cows. If we're having a lot of issues, it's gonna pass more antibodies to the, the, the mother would pass more antibodies through the colostrum. But again, a lot of scour, control of scours has to do with understanding the pathogen in the environment. If we're calving in the same traps, if we're, you know, we're bringing a lot of animals in, so it might just be a biosecurity issue. I've seen a lot of times these scour vaccines work pretty good. Sometimes I've seen where they didn't work very well at all. Kill vaccines, one dose with some kill vaccines, but again, like I said, to my knowledge, I only know of one right now that still just, just says one dose on the bottom. So always read, and if it says two doses, give two doses, right? Keep them cool, keep them clean, and then keep them in the shade because sunlight, all these things are gonna affect these viruses. Buy the right number of doses to avoid wasting product. So if I'm only gonna do 20 cows tomorrow or 20 calves or just 20 animals, then do I wanna go buy a 50 mil, I mean a 50 dose bottle, and I'm not gonna use it for six months? No, uh, in other words, it might be a little cheaper by dose, but then are you really gonna protect those animals later? And, and the answer is no, you might really have some issues with that product. So I recommend buying the smaller doses and less, you know, if I'm doing two or 300 cows, that's a different story. But if I'm dealing with small numbers, I, I wanna buy the smaller bottles, even though they might cost a little bit more. And then the smaller bottles are not as hard to throw away, right? So if I know there's only two or three doses in there, then, and it says to throw it away, there's, if there's 4D doses in there, I'm more likely to keep it longer than I should. Okay. Modified live or kill, which is best? And, and the answer to that is they both have their pluses and they both have their minuses. 
So modified live, and I'm speaking in generalities, but the proponents of the research would say that the modified lives are probably a little bit more effective in your kills, but they have some risk, right? So if I'm putting them in pregnant cows, especially not the right cows that haven't been vaccinated before, or if I'm giving it to pregnant cows that are closer to calving, that's where we've seen the issues with some abortions with modified live products. I know a lot of big ranches where all the cows get a modified live and they've been doing this for, for about 15 years and they've had very good luck. I also know some places where they've had problems. So, so again, you, you probably do, I mean, I think the literature supports that real well. We probably get a little bit better protection with a modified live. Now the advantage of our kills is we don't have the immunosuppression and, and these modified lives do have, especially with the ones with BD, we do have a little bit, in other words, when you vaccinate the animal, since it's replicating in the animal, what modified lives do to get protection, they're going to suppress the immune system somewhat. Now not as much as the disease would, but we need to take that into consideration. With the kill product, we don't get the immunosuppression, but with the kill product, we have to have a booster to get the effect out of that vaccine. Because if you just give one dose, you're just kind of priming the immune system, you have to get that second dose in. Modified live vaccines, again, they must be, they must be hydrated. That's very important. It's, it's, don't shake them up violently because you're going to cause some problems with that vaccine. Sometimes you'll start to, to rupture some of the cells in the vaccine and stuff like that. Use within a couple hours. Whatever you do, don't leave it out in the sun. You know, keep it in the refrigerator, keep it clean, and, uh, and keep it in the shade. And again, as I stressed earlier, buy the right amount because we don't want to waste a lot of vaccine and we want to make sure we get the most advantage out of what we're doing. So this talks a little bit about kill vaccines and this shows the importance of that second shot. So if I give the first shot too early in most diseases, now this is not 100% because some diseases react a little bit different, but let's, let's use black leg for example. If I vaccinate a calf too early, too young for black leg, depending on how much colostrum he got, which would determine maternal antibody, that vaccine might not work very well in that first shot, right? And so then when I come and give him a booster, then actually it's acting like the first shot, so I'd need to give a, a second shot later. So again, I'd like to get that black leg vaccine in there about three months. Now, again, you're getting black, black leg storms, vaccinate everything that walks, but you just keep that in mind. If you're giving it too early, you might not be getting effect out of that first vaccination. Your second vaccination though is so important and I see that so many times people will give a black leg shot, they don't follow up and then they get out there about the time they're weaning those calves, they're fixing to sell them, and bingo, we have four or five times black leg. So vaccine responses, okay, so red is a modified live. So usually when I give that first shot, and most, now some do, so again, follow the directions, most modified lives do not require a booster because that's like getting the disease. The organism is acting in your body. It's, it's replicating, it's doing all the things like it would in the disease process. So that's the reason you get a pretty good measure of resistance. And you can see that red line goes up pretty much, just keeps climbing, right? And so then with our internasal products, we we'll spend a lot of time on this. This is, we use these a lot of, maybe some special deals or we use it in doctors and stuff like that. But again, we'll get a fairly good response, but it'll wane pretty fast too. Then if we're given a kill product, that's the yellow. So initially after that first shot, we get a little bit of a bump, but then we start back down. If we give that second shot, the booster shot, we usually call, call this, then it kind of combines the reaction from the first shot together and you see we get a pretty good spike. 
That's the reason it is so, so important to get that booster if you're using the kill product. So we'll talk a little bit about BBD. Again, basically what's happening here is, is this, this is what happens in a, in a herd, right? So if a calf is infected and we don't have a lot of time to spend on the disease process, but if it's infected at the right stage, it's deer in gestation while well, it's in mama, then the virus doesn't recognize that, it's, it's, the calf doesn't recognize that virus is being born. Basically that virus becomes part of the calf. So it continually sheds that virus for the rest of its life. So you can see that's why it's so important to keep your cow herd immunized properly, plus all the biosecurity things, being careful bringing cows in, et cetera. But that's the difference in it. And that vaccine going to prevent this the calf in the middle from happening, a PI calf, has, to, has a little higher bar than the vaccine I would want to give to some doctors to protect them for, uh, for BVD. This is the other, so that was the reproductive side. This is the other thing we'll see with stalkers, feeders, whatever. This is a, a mucosal disease or BDD that's caused a lot of respiratory issues, right? So again, these calves are gonna die. So let's talk a little bit about lepto. Lepto is pretty common all over Texas. A lot of the, the, the ones that are carried by feral swine and stuff like that, they're more in wet areas, right? So it's a spirochete. This little organism can get into the system real fast. I always think it's interesting if I put a little of this organism into the, just drop it in the eye of the guinea pig, I can recover from its blood in about 15 minutes. So it looks like a little screw and it, and it gets into organism in pretty fast. What's my risk? So my risk are gonna be things like feral swine, skunks, these are carry a, a lot of lepto, right? So I'm showing this little hog and he's getting down this water. He's rooting around if he urinates there. The lepto that goes into that tank, again, how big's the tank? How many hogs are urinating in it? It's going to be there for at least six months. That, that organism lives pretty long in those tanks, right? Same way with the skunk. So again, good vaccination protocol there is going to really help with the lepto. Many places you need to give it twice a year, not all places. Again, talk to your veterinary. Now, twice a year is good, four times a year is not better because sometimes then you start having issues with your vaccine causing more problems than your disease. Okay. So again, this is just showing a tank and this was when I was in practice. We did have a fair bit of Hargeobobus and, and I used that as an example. You know, this was in the summer and, and these old cows down in that tank and urinating around the edge of the tank, et cetera, okay? So let's talk about sexually transmitted diseases real quick, pre predominantly Vibrio and Trick, right? So timing is so important here. So if I'm giving these products at the wrong time, then I'm wasting my money and these, and these vaccines are not cheap, right? Read the label, but make sure I understand what's on that label following those directions. So in the male, trick or vibrio, and again, I wanna stress the trick and vibrio clinically can look exactly alike. Basically, you see no disease in the male, you see no disease symptoms. I say disease, you see no symptoms in the male nor in the female, except the female aborts cats, right? Or, so they're both clinically look a lot alike. So if I got issues, if I got some signs in my herd, I want to be thinking about, can I have trick? Can I have vibrio? And many times I have them both. So again, on the male, the, the trick especially, and the vibrio to a degree, they don't cause a lot of immune response. They're actually adhered to, to the penis, right? So when that bull breeds a cow, he infects that cow. But I can't measure that bull's blood or anything to tell if he's infected, right? Because he doesn't mount an immune response. He's not ever going to clear that organism from his genes. Cow's a different story. So what happens when she gets infected after the bull breeds her, 
she does, especially in the vaginal vault, she's gonna mount a pretty fast immune response, right? So I could actually measure those antibodies. Again, we don't have a lot of commercial tests, but we do have research tools to do that. And so she, but then they'll stay up there for a little while and they'll wane, right? And, and there's actually some tests, again, research tests, they're not commercially available, that we can look at blood that with the cow sometimes that her titers will spike, right? So, so she has a little different response and that's the reason cows tend to clean up after being infected, bulls don't, okay? So again, you need to understand where that's at and how that's happening. Okay, so going back then with our vaccines. So with Vibrio, again, we that vaccine is pretty darn effective, especially, well, it's effective if we give it according to label. So if I'm vaccinating for Vibrio every year as per label, which would mean if I'm using the products with aluminum hydroxide, they're the easier ones, the thinner ones that are easier to give, then and I'm doing that within 60 days before the bulls go out, it's gonna work pretty darn good. If I'm putting that in, in prep check, it's not gonna work very good because it doesn't have a real long duration of immunity. If I'm using that product in, at prep check, then I need to use a more of an oil-based product, okay? Now, there is a trick vaccine. Does the trick vaccine protect, does it prevent infection? And the answer is no. Is it a good management tool? The answer is yes, if it's given properly. Again, if you're putting trick guard, the trick product vaccine in it, right check, you're wasting your money, right? There's two things that vaccine requires the first year, it requires that you give the injection and then a booster. And then every year after, you give one injection within 60 days prior to breeding. So again, very short duration of immunity on that product, and it's not, it doesn't prevent infection, but it will lessen the number of calves that you lose that, that, are, that are afforded. So, <coughs> pardon me. It's very important that understanding how that product works, you know, does it fit into everybody's program? No, does it, but it would into many people's program, right? I might want to use especially the trick guard, maybe on my heifers because they haven't been exposed yet. They have no immunity at all. But again, those are all questions to have with your veterinarian. Okay, so thank you all very much. And if there's any questions, maybe I have a minute or two to answer any questions.